this July 2019. And we're looking at the pleasant fields and pastures of Leicestershire, one of the central counties in England. A hundred years ago, men would have been returning from the Great War and the horrors that were the Western Front. In fact, the Leicestershire Regiment served not just in France and Flanders, but also in faraway places such as Mesopotamia and Palestine. Returning to these fields, whether they worked in them or whether they worked in the industrial factories in the city of Leicester, must have come as a tremendous relief after all the horrors and tragedies they'd witnessed. However, for one family, one local family near here, a real tragedy occurred in July 1919. It's a mystery, it's known as a murder mystery, it's about the death of a young woman, aged 21, and above all, it is a tragedy. So perhaps you'll follow me on the journey as I explained what happened in that summer of 1919. So a farm gate in the county of Leicestershire. It's a gate like thousands of others, maybe tens of thousands in the country. But this one does have a story attached to it. It's about the death of a young 21-year-old woman called Annie Bella Wright, a local woman, whose family and friends called Bella. On the 5th of July, 1919, in the evening, around about 9.20pm, her body was found next to this gate alongside her bicycle. What had happened to her has become known as the Green Bicycle Murder Mystery. And I'll take you on a journey to show you some of the places associated with that story and perhaps reinvestigate what possibly happened that evening. If you're familiar with this story, then you'll perhaps be interested to see some of the locations. And if it's a brand new story to you, maybe it will gain your interest. Let me say at the outset that this is not a full, complete history of the subject. There is a, a wonderful book you can read on that called The Green Bicycle Murder by C. Wendy East. It was published originally in 1995, 1993, and it's still available, I think, as 2nd editions uh, on Amazon. So that's well, well worth getting a copy of this book if you do become interested in the complete story. So follow me on the journey, and perhaps by the end of the video, you have reached the same conclusion that was drawn by a jury of the day, or maybe have reached a different conclusion. It's an interesting but tragic story. Centre of Leicester and the view of Leicester Town Hall on Fountain Square. Town Hall was opened in 1876, so this would have been a very prominent and well-known landmark to Bella and everybody associated with the Green Bicycle and Murder Mystery. Possibly today, you might have to stop quite a lot of passers-by before you found anybody that knew about the case. Although there have perhaps been more local interest recently because it is the anniversary. If 
we stood there a hundred years ago, during the summer, autumn, winter of 1919 and into 1920, you possibly wouldn't have found anybody who hadn't heard about the case. It was certainly Lester's most infamous murder case right up until possibly the mid-1980s, where unfortunately it was then overtaken in that regard by an even bigger tragedy, the murder of two schoolgirls by Colin Pitchfork. That case became internationally famous because it involved the first use of DNA profiling and genetic fingerprinting that had been discovered by Sir Alex Jeffries and a team at Leicester University. And it was the first time police anywhere in the world had used that to find a killer. And Colin Pitchfork, although he also confessed, was found guilty on the basis of the DNA evidence, which is now, of course, being used worldwide. Back to the Bella Wright story. As I said, it was the most infamous case in Leicestershire until the murder of the two schoolgirls. Still interesting to a lot of criminologists and still being discussed today of what actually happened. So we'll return to the story where it began in the village of Stoughton where Bella lived. So this farm gate in the county of Leicestershire is situated on the Gartree Road near the village of Little Stretton. The Gartree Road is an old, the site of an old Roman road that uh, ran from Colchester, which is in the southeast of England, through the Midlands, through Leicestershire, and then on to the northwest and to Chester. Originally, it was a, a military road for the Roman forces. Now, today, parts of that road in Leicestershire are still being used as roads, um, such as this section where this gate is, and part of it actually goes across uh, open fields. So, on the evening of the 5th of July 1919, at around 9.20pm in the evening, a local farmer was bringing some uh, of his herd, some of his animals, along the road. And from a distance he spotted what he thought initially was some sort of rug or blanket that it may be have fallen from a uh, horse vehicle. But as he got closer he realised it was the body of a young woman. His initial thoughts would be naturally that she'd had a cycling accident because a bike was laying near her, her feet was pointing towards Leicester and her head was pointing towards Burton Overy. Uh, top half of her body, including her head, was on the road and the knees and the lower part of her, her legs were on the grass verge. He noticed some blood on her and having... Um, realised she was now dead, he thought to move her to uh, a, perhaps a, a better position to just move her away from the road from, from any passing traffic, although traffic even these days along this road is not that extensive. But by doing so, of course, he may have uh, destroyed some of the evidence that might later have been um, seen to be of importance. But obviously at the time he thought it was a young girl that had a bicycling accident. So he rushes home to his house, asks his wife to send out two of the uh, workmen to, to guard the body while he goes off on horseback to the nearby village of Great Glen, where the local police constable was based. He finds him and uh, while the PC Hall who is the local police constable, goes and gets his bike. He asks the farmer to telephone the local doctor, which is another uh, village, some a little distance away, called Bilsden. Uh, so by the time the PC and the farmer 
uh, I drive back to the site of the fatality, it was probably more like now 10.15 and the light's really going. And by the time the doctor arrives, because he wasn't at home initially, it's possibly even later. So by now the light's pretty well gone, of course, even though it's the um, height of summer. Um, but the initial conclusion is that this girl's had a truck accident and died from a, a bicycle accident. They then put her on what's described as a milk float, but it's probably one of those uh, vehicles which you they used to put milk churns on, drawn by horses. And she's taken to the local village of Little Stretton. And in there, there is a building which is a Baptist chapel. I think during this particular period of time it was pretty run down. But now today it's been used as a village hall type um, facility. And Bella was laid out in the chapel. Again, the doctor initial conclusion was that she'd either hemorrhaged or um, she'd hemorrhaged from uh, this bicycling accident. And of course, by now, it's, it's, they're trying to work by candlelight, so there's not a lot of um, light to, to show any other result. Um, she's got a hat on, she's fully closed, etc., during the night, though, PC Hall, who had also had some experience during the Great War, wasn't really satisfied with the doctor's conclusion. And he went back and examined the body again, and he found a small puncture wound under the left eye. And also, um, I'm not sure if he found it at the time or later it was found again by the re-examination of the doctor, an exit wound going through the back of her head with the blood being matted uh, with her hair. He revisited the scene twice on the Sunday now, and eventually he finds a spent .455 cartridge. With that discovery, the doctor is recalled. A more thorough examination is take, co taken out, and they realise that she has actually been shot. That was then the conclusion of the post-mortem, which then took place on the Monday. So now we have a younger woman lying on the side of the road who's been shot. Who is she? What are the circumstances that bring that event? So as we move through this story, let me first say I'm certainly not an expert on this story. I'm just a local person who's been interested in it for a number of years and now it's the anniversary so it's a good time just to bring it perhaps to uh, a wider public. So as we go through the story we'll examine various aspects of the case and perhaps then you will have reached a conclusion by the end of the video of what actually happened that day. So Bella lived with her family in the local village of Stoughton. At the time of their death, she was 21. She was just shy of her 22nd birthday. She'd been born in 1897, the Jubilee year for Queen Victoria. Father had been a farm labourer all his life and the family had moved around various locations and moved to Stoughton, I think, in April 1919, so not that long before she met her untimely death. Bella had left school when she was 13, like most people did in those days, and she started in domestic service. Again, it was very common for the middle class to have living maids, etc. First World War tended to change a lot of women's roles, of course, and they were now doing work that the men used to do, but were now, with the Great War, uh, they were called into things like driving trams and uh, munitions work. In fact, the women who worked in the munitions were often called canaries because their skin turned yellow from the cordite uh, that they were working with. 
But Bella worked in um, a number of factories, hosiery factory, which Lester was famous for. By the time of her death, she worked in a company called W.A. Bates, who were manufacturing pneumatic tyres, which also features in this story. That building is still there on the uh, canal where it uh, joins with the Leicester River Saw. And the week before her death, she'd been on a, an outing with her friends to the nearby Foxton Locks, which is also quite a famous beauty spot, spot locally. And she seems to be a well-rounded, um, confident, well-liked young lady. She was going out with, as they said at the time, a, a young man who was a sailor in service with the Royal Navy at the time of her death. So he was obviously completely cleared of any involvement. I don't think she was actually engaged to him, but um, there was a sort of understanding, as people used to say then. On Saturday the 5th of July, she would returned on the previous evening from a night shift at her employment at Bates. She got in late, so she slept in on the Saturday morning, and in the afternoon she got up and she intended to go to another local village of Ellington to post some letters, presumably one was to Archie, a young man. And then she was going over to her uh, uncle's cottage at the nearby village of Galby. And what we're going to do is follow the route that she took to that and the circumstances then that led to her being found next to the gate on the Gartry Road. So as we leave the village of Stoughton I'm not actually showing the house where Bella's family lived out of respect for the current owners but we're leaving that now and moving through the village of Stoughton St Mary's Church it's on our right hand side and then we'll be turning left onto the Gorby Lane as we leave Stoughton there are some houses that were built to presumably house the RAF officers with the building of an airfield nearby. That airfield was constructed in 1942 and opened in 1943. It initially housed uh, two RAF squadrons flying short sterling bomber aircraft and I think for a period they were actually involved in um, kind of clandestine operations to drop in SOE operatives and SAS staff uh, and those sort of operations. Later, the American 82nd Airborne, that was also based in and around Leicestershire, they had um, housing on the, um, or accommodation, not housing, but tented accommodation on some of the parks in uh, Leicester, Victoria Park, the Braunston Park, and they took off um, by Dakotas and gliders from uh, what was called Stoughton Airfield, which is now Leicester Airport, for operations such as Operation Market Garden, of course. But that's a story for another day. The airport is now home to the Leicestershire Aero Club, where people are flying light aircraft to gain their PPLs. There's also a helicopter-based company, and there's other activities as well. But part of the route that Bella took... Uh, has now disappeared because it was engulfed by the airport. We'll have a look at now some of the maps so you can orientate uh, what we're looking at on the video. There's a modern day map of the area which is the Ordnance British Ordnance Survey Explorer 233 and on this we can see the route I've marked where she left Stoughton Village on the Gorby Lane, marked in the yellow outliner, goes along the road and then cuts across where the airfield now is and the road disappears 
and it resurfaces on the other side of the airfield and carries on. And in a subsequent trial, that was called uh, the top road to distinguish it from the bottom road. And we can see the road now going along to the village of Golby. And then from Golby, it comes re it reverts back to a crossroads. And then it turns along the Burton Overy Road, which eventually goes to a place called Great Len. And then reaches the Gartree Road. Part of the Gartree Road now goes across fields. But if we turn back towards Leicester, we're now along the Gartry Road. And when we follow that road along, we'll reach the gateway again where Bella was found uh, dead and shot. I then, on the assumption that she'd have carried on, there's a further line which shows the line going back to Stoughton. Now one of the mysteries of the case is why did she take that second route back rather than the shorter route that she originally had taken to Galby. Again that's something to, to look at, something to think about. What were the reasons behind that? And there could be a number of reasons behind that we'll, we'll take a look at. Also, now we're looking at photocopies of some of the original Ordnance Survey maps dated from 1902. So again, we see the village of Stoughton, we see St Mary's Church, and we see the Gorby Lane. And obviously what is missing from that map is the airfield, because that was constructed in 1942. Now the other map just shows the picture of Little Stretton again as of 1902 with very very little change compared to today and in that we can see the Baptist Church the chapel where Bella was taken after she'd been discovered on the evening of the 5th of July. We've now gone past the airfield and we can see now approximately this is where the road uh, would have come out um, before uh, it was uh, taken up by the airfield. And now we carry on to the village of Galby. Something to note now as we drive along this road is some of the, not steepness as such, but there are some hills, ups and downs on this way. And that might be one reason that she didn't return along this same route, which we'll talk about a little later. Now, as she cycled along, somewhere along this road on the way to Galby, According to later statements, she had a problem with her bike. And that hasn't come from her, of course, because she uh, unfortunately didn't survive the day. But she met up with a man and she asked him, according to his story, if he had any spanners, which he, didn't, he said he didn't have. But he said he would then go with her the rest of the way into Galby to her relatives. He said he'd come from Great Glen. That's the village, of course, where the uh, policeman had been called uh, upon finding her body. If, he, if he'd have come from Great Glen, he'd come on what's called Burton Overy Road. And we'll see the turn-off from that road. In any event, he now goes with her into the village of Galby why she goes and visits her relatives. And he stays outside the house. And he's there for the total time she's in the house. 
So Bella was visiting her uncle in the village of Gulby, now accompanied by this stranger. That day, her uncle was there, but his wife was out, but he was being visited by one of his daughters and her husband and two young children. When Bella went into the cottage, um, there's been a number of conversations, not all I'm going to repeat here, but again, they're all well documented. And certainly our uncle saw this stranger hanging around outside and questioned who he was. Bella said that he was uh, a stranger to her, she didn't know him, and that he'd accompanied her. Um, she arrived probably, estimates are around uh, 7.15, to the, the cottage, Um Almost certainly she would have probably wanted to get home back to Stoughton before it got really dark. But she seemed to stay perhaps longer than she intended. At one point she uh, made a remark that um, she'd had problems with her bike. And um, the uncle's son-in-law discussed that. And also she made a remark that she might be able to give this man the slip. But at the same time, she didn't seem to be too worried by him. At one point, the stranger came up and actually had a conversation about his bike, which was a BSA, a special model bicycle, in green. And that's why we get the name of the green bicycle murder. It's nothing to do with Bella's bike. It's all to do with the stranger's bike. And this bike has a back-pedalling brake. I mean, most bikes at the time probably would have been uh, the black and white, the standard colour, and most British bikes were just the normal uh, cable brakes from the handlebar. But this had uh, a back-pedalling brake. So engineering-wise, it was more complicated. Um, and later events might prove that this stranger turned out to be an engineer, so perhaps that type of bike uh, appealed to him. So they had, he had a conversation with, a uh, brief conversation um, with the relatives um, and he also mentioned Bella by her first name saying something like, oh you've been a long time, I thought you'd gone the other way because out of the village of Galby there are two routes back to the road that brings you in um, from the Stoughton Way that we've, we've previously been on. Um, he later said in a statement that she'd said to him she was only going to be 10 minutes or so and he took that as a reason to, to wait for her. But in fact, she didn't leave until somewhere around 8.45, maybe even closer to 9 o'clock before they were both seen walking out of the village, the route we're now looking at. And again, I'm not showing... Uh, her uncle's house in Golby, out of respect for the present occupants. They walked out of the village together, and that was the last time her relatives saw her alive. Quite a short time frame here, window of time, because she was found by the farmer at, say, 9.20 or 9.25, and she's only left Golby um, perhaps at 10 to 9 or 5 to 9, and it's at least a 15 minute bike ride to get from Galby to where she was found dead. So not a very long period there, which again might have a factor on how you view the case. So they left Galby together. Some conversations had taken place about him, who he was, and that uh, he didn't look a very good character. They all later described that he had a squeaky voice, which was one of the things the police were later looking for. But at the same time, she didn't seem that apprehensive about going with him, and he had mentioned her by her first name. So that does bring the question in, had he previously met her before this visit? And we'll talk about that a little bit later on again. So they now leave Galby, they're back on the road to Stoughton, and we come to the point where 
what has happened next. Now the quickest route back would have been straight on back to Stone the way she had originally come. But for some reason she obviously turned left now along the road that then leads to the Gartry Road which we'll be seeing. But in those days the road she turned left on had two gates, farm gates. So again more obstacles to overcome on the way back. Um, she then rode along this road and we'll come to the turn off. To the left is the Godtree Road going across the fields. Straight on is the road to Burton Over in Great Glen, presumably the road that this stranger had come from. And when she turns right now, we go along the Godtree Road and eventually we'll come to the gate where she was found shot dead. Now that the police know it's a murder, or it's certainly death by gunfire, not unnaturally the first people they want to speak to is the man with the green bike. The cartridge, the sorry not the cartridge, the bullet had been found on the road, a .455 old style bullet. In fact, it was a bullet that had been converted from black powder to smokeless powder. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit more when we look about the, the particular potential firearm. So now the cry goes out to try and find the man on the green bicycle. It's in the papers locally. This is a major case for Leicester at the time. And the weeks and the months go by. Nobody comes forward, nobody's identified as the person with the green bicycle. A reward is offered for £5 for any information leading to the discovery of the green bicycle. Okay, now the police were lucky because the relative, the um, son-in-law of her uncle, was a knowledgeable cyclist and he's able to give a very good description of this green bike because also he talked to the stranger about it and they were all able to give a fairly good description of the actual man involved. So they had a fairly accurate description of the age of the person and the bike but they weren't able to trace that. Now obviously back in the days we're talking about the main mode of transport for people was uh, if they're in the city, it would have been on the trams or the bus or bicycle. If they went out into the countryside, it would have been uh, bicycles or walking or, or sharabangs, which were the early type uh, bus coaches. And if they went longer distance, trains. Cars were few and far between. And they were only being used by people like uh, doctors, etc., not the general public. So, although biking has become really popular again recently in the UK, uh, back then it was extremely popular and people, uh, most people had bikes. Uh, even right up to the 1950s when uh, the factories emptied, thousands of people would come out on bikes. So to try and trace one green bike was a very difficult task for the police. seven months from July 1919 when Bella was found to February 1920 and we return to the area of St Mary's Mills that is where if you remember Bella worked and in February 1920 a bar G was delivering coal to St Mary's Mills using a horse-drawn canal boat and as he approaches St Mary's Mills, the rope from the barge dips into the water and up comes the front end of a bicycle frame, the front wheel and frame. The rear wheel's not there. And it's green. And given all the subsequent information about the case, he obviously then realised this was a potential found, plus there was a £20 reward. 
I think the uh, bike initially slipped off his rope, so he had to come back. And he was accompanied then, or he met, uh, the father of Archie, who is the Bella's boyfriend. Maybe he had heard about this discovery, or he was purely there by coincidence. But they managed to bring up this part of a bike. When the police investigated, there had been a serious attempt to a dismantle it and remove the back wheel because that had the distinctive back pedaling feature and attempts to file off the BSA name and file off the serial numbers. So we can see here is the deliberate attempt to identify the to um, to stop the identification of this bike. But one part of the bike there was a serial number, and the police, through tracing this to the manufacturer and then to the manufacturer who had sold it to a company in Derby, and from that company, they were able to trace the bike that had been purchased in 1910 by a man called Ronald Light. I'm not going to go into the full history of Ronald Light because again you would be better to read uh, some of the books involved but he had been uh, an engineer and he'd been in the Chartered Engineers as well. During the First World War he had a temporary commission as an officer but had been advised by his commanding officer to resign that commission and again I'm not quite sure the reasons behind that particularly at a time when they were desperate for men and the officer casualty rate was tremendous but he re-enlisted and he became a, a gunner in the Honourable Artillery Company one stage he was court martialed because he was caught issuing false orders for the battery not to proceed to France and through handwriting experts it was discovered that he had written these notes um, not to go to France or to send his company to France. He'd been diagnosed with what there was then called shell shock and partial deafness obviously due to being in barrages in the First World War and was sent home uh, for uh, medical help and I think psychiatric help. At the time of this discovery of the Green Bicycle he was employed in a school in Cheltenham as a teacher and again although he hadn't been trained as a teacher uh, there was a shortage obviously of young men and young officer type men from the Great War, from the carnage of the Great War. So the police obviously visited him in Cheltenham. He initially denies having the green bicycle and he denies um, having been out to Corby with Bella. Uh, having said that, that all was to change later on when we come to the trial. In the interim, the police are now dragging the canal for what other evidence they can find. And again, we can well imagine that again, uh, over quite a distance there would have been a lot of rubbish uh, as there would be today thrown into the canal and again we're talking about days when they weren't using underwater, underwater scuba police search teams they were using rakes and grab hooks and they even had a device which was like a big uh, cylinder with a glass bottom uh, and glass top so you could easy to be able to see something that was lying on the bottom of the canal. Over time they brought up um, various things including a holster with some cartridges in and the type of cartridges were identical to the bullet that had been found near Bella. These were 0.455 service cartridges that had been converted from black powder to smokeless powder because the British Army some years before had moved from gunpowder, black powder to smokeless powder. The holster was the type that would have been used for a service revolver, like a Webley, which again we'll, we'll look at in a bit more detail. There had been an attempt 
to scribe out the name and perhaps the serial number of the owner in the holster. With that evidence, of course, Wright was arrested and charged with the murder of Bella. And he was subsequently put on trial at the Leicester Court.